Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for Let's Chat. My name is Shayla Reeves, and today we're going to be talking about It's Okay Not to Be Okay. We have an awesome group of people giving an hour on their Friday night to have this conversation. I'm going to play a quick intro to give uh, folks about another minute or so to join us, and then we'll launch into the conversation. <laughs> I always like to create an environment where people feel comfortable to ask questions. You don't always know what you don't know. You may not have it all figured out today, and that's okay. Taking one step at a time, those glimmers become a consistent light. It all finally begins to click. Each and every moment that you experience is shaping the person you are in this life to be. Sometimes our pain points go all the way back to childhood. What if I allowed myself to imagine a life that was more spacious and expansive than the one I'm living? What if I don't have to live the same way that everyone else is living. When you are authentic, your energy changes yes. and the people around you change. It's just like doors just start opening. You're like, well, wait, how did this happen? How did this happen? How did this happen? You're showing up completely different. And often it does require healing and going in some uncomfortable spaces before we can truly flourish. All right, thank you so much for joining us for Let's Chat. I'm gonna be uh, bringing up our participants individually here so you can meet all the folks joining us for It's Okay Not To Be Okay. Uh, first, we'll bring up Dr. Zakia Robbins McNeil. She is an accountability coach, author, and professor. She is the author of the book, Hashtag All Done, A Real Practical Guide to Go From College Student to Graduate. Thank you so much for join, joining us, uh, Dr. Zakia Robinson McNeil. We also have joining us here, Deborah Talon. She is a, you do a lot of things, Deborah, but among, <laughs> amongst your many titles, you are definitely one of the most creative people I've, I've seen on social. So I'm so excited to have you here. Creative multidisciplinarian, master's in education and BFA, right? That's right. Okay. Awesome. And so you all will love Deborah's creative uh, magic. I'll show you just a little bit here, and then we'll show a little bit more later. These are some of her amazing, colorful masterpieces. Um, I love it. Thanks so much for joining us. And then we also have today Julie Montgomery Reese. She is a school counselor, and she's also a farmer. Her family farm, Steady Hand Farm, um, they raise their produce on a 70 acre farm situated situated um, in Polk County near St. Croix Falls and Amory, Wisconsin. Thank you so much for joining us. And then hopefully shortly, we'll be hearing from Lehman Riley. He is an author of some awesome children's books, the Papa Lemon's Little Wanderers series. And um, he tackles a number of topics, including depression and bullying and some of the children's books that he writes. So I look forward to seeing him shortly uh, when he joins us to be a part of this conversation. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I want to start with you, Deborah. Uh, and actually, it was a social media post that you had that kind of got me. I had kind of been thinking about this topic. But then when I saw your post, it's one that made me say, OK, this is a topic that we should talk about because I think a lot of people probably feel like this sometimes where you have to put on a, fit, a friendly face or 
it almost feels like you're wearing a mask and you can't really fully express what you really feel. Um, this was the post that you shared and, and, and it kind of prompted me to reach out to you. Um, this was a few weeks ago. You had shared it's unfair when everything is beautiful and life is good and you're healthy and well and you're surrounded by loved ones and work is full filling and creative or creativity is flowing, but you still can't shake the crippling anxiety and depression that comes out of nowhere. There's no other way to put it. It's just unfair. There's so much good in my life and I have gratitude every day, keeping tabs and taking notes on it all. Yet despite all of the good, life still feels overwhelming and out of control for me much of the time. It's been like this since I was little, just the way it is, but I continue to do the big work, just dove into another round of big, big work, meds, therapy, long walks, and with good music, reconnecting with friends, posting about mental health again. And I'm going to keep doing it because the stigma needs to be gone, especially in my field, working with children. We need to talk about mental and emotional well-being and coping skills and how to work through the ultimately and ultimately regulate big feelings. I'm not going to hide. I'm going to reach out and look to connect because I know mm -hmm. I can't the only one in the ring in the trenches. Thanks for everyone who has reached out so far. It's incredibly meaningful and powerful to receive your messages. And you are definitely not alone. I know so many people um, feel the anxiety, the worry, and you worry that you're supposed to be fulfilling certain expectations. But then on the inside, you just feel the anxiety raging. Can you talk a little bit um, about your journey um, and, and what kinds of conversations do you find yourself having with yourself to navigate those spaces? Well, in the work that I do, so I'm also an, an assistant director of an early childhood program at the Minnesota JCC in Minneapolis. I'm in my office right now after hours for some peace and quiet. And um, in this work, I'm constantly thinking about mental and emotional well-being because I work with little littles. Um, birth to five, and it's really important to me that they have a better understanding of their emotions than I ever did. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking about these things every single day, and it makes me hyper aware of my own stuff because I need to keep my own stuff in check so I can give my best to these little people and to my own daughter, Luna, who's sick, um, who's going through all kinds of things right now because she's sick. So um, ever since I was very little, I have felt a lot. I'm a highly sensitive person. I was a highly sensitive child. There's books about it. And mm -hmm. I am a highly sensitive adult. And um, it can really get in the way, but it can also be my superpower. And I use it to my benefit at work. Um, I'm a, a feeler, and I can feel what people are feeling, um, and I use that to everybody's benefit. I, I really try to be a good friend, a kind um, partner, a kind person, um, and that's what I want to instill in all the little people that I work with. That's so, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And Dr. Z, can you talk about the challenges that can come with I mean, that creates pressure if if you feel like you have to be a certain way outwardly, but then on the inside, uh, it's so what you're feeling is so different than that. What kind of pressure can that put on a person? I mean, life as it is, is already sometimes stressful, but then the added burden of being and having to exist in a way that doesn't feel um, like the truest representation of you and who you are, that can create more barriers and challenges too, right? Yes, Deborah mentioned something, and I was just like, oh my goodness. It's like you, I don't know what age range you're in, but I know that the generation that I was raised in, we were raised to suck it up and keep moving. Mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. I don't know if it's a woman thing. <laughs> you know, I don't know if it's a generation thing. It's just like you have to hold it together regardless of what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. And it's not healthy, right? It's mm -hmm. not healthy for you is not helpful for anyone around you because you you know you discuss dealing with the littles the littles can pick up on things like that oh, yeah. um and they can pick up when you know they can pick up when we're down even when we're like faking it which i'll i'll discuss more later about the faking it till you make it um that's not being authentically yourself 
Like it is okay to have down days. It is okay to be sad. It is okay to be in your feelings. We will never heal if we don't allow ourselves to feel. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that, Deborah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with, you know, I, I, so I will just put it out there, I'm 38. And uh, yeah, absolutely. My generation was like, especially as, as a little girl, it was like, you're fine you're fine. Everything's fine. It's going to be okay. You're fine. Um, my mom used to say, be a duck, let it roll off. And I was like, I'm not a duck. <laughs> this is really hard. <laughs> I'm feeling a lot of things. And um, so now uh, you're okay is not a phrase that we use at school. Um, and it's not something I say in my house because like, yeah, I, I know that my daughter in the moment is okay but in the moment she doesn't feel okay and i i want to let her have that and be like hmm you look upset and just validate 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 um so she can move through those feelings faster instead of mm -hmm. just like stifling it and having her put it away Mm -hmm. And Julie, you have to navigate uh, those spaces with kids and kids have really been dealing mm -hmm. with a lot over the course of the last year, a lot of change, a lot of transition. Sometimes for kids, school may be their safe place, but when they're having mm -hmm. to learn from home, I mean, that's a different dynamic and they're trying to learn how to be and how to exist in the world that we're in. I mean, the pandemic has changed so much of what normal is. Um, do you find yourself navigating this space with some of the students that you try to reach through your work as a school counselor? Uh, absolutely. I'm echoing just what has been said. I think that most adults and student, young people are experiencing much more anxiety than they ever have been in the past. And people are talking about it because it's real for them. And I do think even though we have a long ways to go in terms of lifting stigma and creating safer spaces to discuss and support folks through, um, through emotions and also just mental health, um, I think we've come a long way. And, you know, I, I guess like one thing that came up for me just listening to Deborah and Dr. Z is just the idea of affirming someone's emotional state in that moment um, is really important because it teaches them that they can trust themselves first and foremost. And no, you don't want to stay in that feeling forever. <laughs> but if you don't allow yourself to feel it, then you're not going to be able to move through it, learn from it and gain that wisdom from it. So I think, too, it's it's teaching kids those skills um, to be able to feel the feelings and then also have that mindfulness to kind of separate and not totally be the emotion, but to say, hey, what is this emotion telling me? What can I learn from it? What do I need to do right now to take care of myself? Mm -hmm. um, so really honoring that and trying to build those skills right now is, is, is critical with everything that's going on, all the uncertainty. And sometimes people, I mean, the conversation that they have with themselves is trying to sort of um, tamp down that internal voice that's saying like, I'm, I'm fine, but you're really not fine and trying to put on that brave face. But what you're saying, and um, I see Dr. Z also um, affirming is you need to, the first step is to acknowledge what you feel is what you feel and then make peace with it yourself in some ways. Would you say Dr. Z? Yes, indeed. I was sitting back thinking, it's like, um, when we don't acknowledge our feelings, we're telling ourselves that, or a lot of times we might think that we are failing. Mm -hmm. We think that we're failing when we're dealing with anxiety. We think we're failing when we're dealing with depression. We think we're failing, we're failing when we're not feeling anything except for okay. And that in and of itself is a problem because it's not allowing yourself to be human. It's not allowing yourself to go through life, life's ups and downs, you know? So if you constantly are feeling depressed and anxious, but you're not allowing yourself to actually feel it and work through coping with it or work through dealing with whatever you need to do to kind of minimize, you know, maybe you need to change something in your life in order to move through those feelings. Mm -hmm. If we constantly suppress, then we will never heal then we will still never be okay. So it's like a constant cycle of if you actually don't deal with it, if you don't acknowledge that you're actually feeling it, how can you move through it? And how can you get to the other side? 
And sometimes it really takes courage to confront who and what you really are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that can in itself feel scary or overwhelming to acknowledge it because if you don't have either the support system or maybe an ear or something around you, the acknowledgement, the other side of it is then what? Like, okay, so I acknowledge I feel this way, then what? And maybe there's that fear of there's no one there to catch you like or help you navigate the so what it's like you've made yourself really vulnerable and for what reason and yeah and it could could it in some ways keep you in that space you think julie um i think it really you kind of touched on where's your support system at and who do you have who's willing to affirm you in your process and i think that is critical everybody needs supportive people in their lives um, some folks end up you know, doing that through therapy as well, formal route um, of hiring someone um, through the medical system to get that support. But, you know, whether that's a safe family member, maybe you have chosen family because your family of origin is not able to provide the emotional support that you need um, to be your authentic self. Um, but you, it's, it's, we're human, just going back to Dr. D's thing, we're human. Like we, we have to have social connection to be able to thrive and heal. It's not something you can do alone. Mm -hmm. um, and so absolutely having, having supportive people in your life is critical. Okay. And I want to share a couple of comments that we're receiving. Thank you for that so much, Julie. Um, Ramona shares great talk. And then Bobby Denson Davis says, this is a wonderful conversation. Thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Of course, if you have a comment or if something resonates with you, definitely leave us a comment below so that we can share that with the participants. If you have a question or anything, um, post that as well. And uh, maybe we can get an answer for you um, from some of our participants. Um, for you, Deborah, was there ever a time when you had anxiety or worried about being as vulnerable and honest as you were in the message that we started off mm -hmm. with? Like, did you have to come to a place where being able to share yourself in that way in a public forum was something you felt um, courageous enough to do? There are big changes happening in my life right now. And it took a long time to make that decision to make those changes. And um, it was a slow buildup build that courage to make sure I had support in place to make sure that I have therapy on Wednesdays at five and like mm -hmm. a couple good good people who I can lean on and that my daughter was going to feel supported through all of it and and um, it it took years <laughs> to reach that place and um, and I'm relieved and I'm grateful and I'm proud that I've reached this point to say, I need to make a big change here and I'm ready to make that big change and it's gonna be okay. Cause I have a lot of skills in myself, had a lot of therapy uh, mm -hmm. still in it. And um, I, I think all of, all of the things that I've gained up to this point have prepared me for what I'm embarking on and, and I um, feel safe to do that now. Yeah. And safe is so important. People have to feel safe to move forward, to do, to share who you are. You have to have that level of comfort. Why is that so critical? You think, Julie? Well, I mean, Dr. Maslow, um, one of the foundational social workers would would just say we have as human beings we have foundational needs and safety um, security and that's why we talk about housing being so critical um, for students to be able to learn for instance mm -hmm. um, but but having just that uh, level of safety um, for your personal self um, safe and and I think too that's where that's where anxiety kind of hearing Dr. Z talk just um, you know saying um, Oh, I lost my train of thought. But just just feeling like sometimes that anxiety or the depression can kind of feel like it's attacking you. And it, and it it's almost is attacking your sense of self and your own sense of safety from within. And so that's, again, just kind of getting back to sometimes we have to reach out to others and take that risk to say that we're not doing well in order to um, 
to be heard, to be seen, to be supported, to have that personal sense of safety. Because, because our mental health, our brain is kind of fighting against us feeling safe with ourselves. Um, so, you know, and that's something like really trying to educate young people that sometimes your brain is working against you. And so we have to kind of like help you understand how your brain's working. And then to your point, Deborah, those skills and tools to help you cope and kind of be able to see it and move, move beyond it and work, you know, get yourself into a healthier place. But again, it can't happen alone. And so other people providing you a sense of safety, acceptance, love, care in your humanity in whatever you're feeling and experiencing is just so critical for you to even be able to talk or open up about these things. That's so true. And one of the points that I, I wanted to, to ask you all about is fear. It, it, it may be that barrier that keeps people from acknowledging that they aren't okay. Like just making like the recognition and saying like, I am not okay. Like embracing that for what it is. Um, fear can prevent people from sharing the, the truest version of who they are. Sometimes it can hide mm -hmm. the truest version of who you are. Mm -hmm. um, I go to therapy too, Deborah. So I like, I definitely like, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and, and that was a conversation that I recently had even with my therapist is sometimes fear can lead you down a rabbit hole that takes you away from the person that you actually are. And so mm -hmm. you, I view like who I really am is a creative deep thinker that loves to laugh and help other people see the best of who they are. But fear, like it totally hides that person. Mm -hmm. And the more power that it's given, the further away from the most um, amazing parts of who I am that you see. Like I'm only a shell or a shadow of myself when I give fear that power. Um, do you um, do you ever um, kind of think about those kinds of things too, or navigate those spaces as well, Deborah? Definitely. Um, when I am allowing the anxiety or the depression to just take over, I don't really exist anymore, and mm -hmm. that doesn't work. Um, there are people relying on me to function. So um, I have to recognize when I'm in it, notice it. Um, and I'm usually able to catch it and be like, I am in my emotional mind, which is a very dialectical behavioral term, DBT term. I'm in my emotion mind. I need to get into my wise mind. I need to remember this is not reality. I am, I am, you know, going down that rabbit hole. I'm going global, as I like to say, and I need to just what is real right now? What is actually happening? And, um, you know, dig deep into those DBT skills from my past or um, my self care skills and, um, you know, say no to a few things around me to like get recentered and um, just stay in reality that way. That's so that's awesome. One of the things that I started doing and it's so crazy because it actually works. I gave my fear a name. I named my fear Felicia. Yeah. So anytime I feel anxiety coming, I say bye Felicia. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, so it's like my way of like acknowledging it. And then sometimes Felicia and I have to have a conversation. It will say, hi, Felicia, I know you're there, but right now I need to do this. And it's just like that way of acknowledging how I feel. Like I know this is here, but I got to focus on these better parts of myself. Um, and I was like, this, is this actually going to work? It actually works. It's crazy. So a lot of by Felicia's when anxiety creeps up. I want to share some of the um, messages that we're receiving here. You have one, Beth Ann. Hello, my friend. Friend Deb, thank you for being so wonderful and being my support when I'm struggling. I thank you, you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing that, Beth Ann. And then we also have Margaret here. Margaret says, thank you very much to the panel, to the facilitator. This is a very inspirational platform and you all sound very empowered. Thank you for sharing your stories. And thank you for sharing that feedback with us, Margaret. We so appreciate you. Um, Bobby shared, we never stop growing and learning. The work is hard. But we have to have true support systems who we can go to without shame and fear 
None of us are okay. We need each other. Mm -hmm. That is so true. Everybody needs somebody. Great point, Bobby. Mm -hmm. And let's see, uh, Beth Ann says, knowing you get it helps me through it. Mm -hmm. And I believe that echoes as well um, what, what uh, Julie was saying is, is that we all really need um, that support system in place um, to help us because and inevitably we're all going to have that hard moment or that point that's just a little too much to tackle on our own and just knowing that there's one person out there that understands us or gets us or even if they don't get it they're just willing to listen it can make the difference when you need it the most um mm -hmm. cheryl also commenting here great tips loving this ladies yes bye felicia <laughs> Yes, it helps. I'm telling you, you can give your fear a name. If you want it to be Betty, you can say bye, Betty, whatever. <laughs> but yeah, so um, it's OK not to be OK. And we have to really I think it's important to have conversations like this to sort of normalize the, the fact that people do feel this way. And it's not something that you have to tackle by yourself. And so creating spaces like this to have these conversations hopefully pushes others forward in their journeys too. Um, Dr. Z, how important do you feel it is to, to normalize just conversation around mental health, anxiety, fear? We all have it, but we don't have to do it by ourselves. Yes. So it is very important to, I, I want to say like find your crew. You know, you start to mm -hmm. figure out who you can trust and who you can feel safe with. Like the goal is not to, um, you know, try to invite everybody in to try to help with your issue. However, those people that have the capacity to help and the people that have the know-how or the people, like you said, that will just listen, you know, even if they don't know what to say, just sitting with you or just listening to you or offer, offering, you know, like, let's go out for coffee or, you know, something to kind of take your mind off of it, even if just for a few minutes. Those are the people that you need in your corner. Um, and I feel like you will not find those people if you're not honest with yourself. Like you won't know who will be there for you unless you let people in or unless you let people know what's going on. So I think uh, Deborah, that was very brave of you to post that post because I know a lot of people are feeling that way. I get those phone calls a lot. You know, I get those phone calls a heck of a lot. So sometimes I am that listening ear for other people and it's okay. It's like, okay, you can dump on me because I know how to dump, I know how to dump it right off. It's like, yeah. to play basketball, I'm gonna pass that right off. <laughs> they can get off of you and I'm gonna pass it along. But that is sometimes how you find your people when you post things like you post mm -hmm. or you might send someone a message, you know, I'm glad that people were able to respond to you um, in loving ways um, to kind of help ease your fears. And, you know, hopefully you did see that you had more people um, that are going through the same thing, but other people that are willing to support you at that time. And that's what's needed for everybody. Bobby says, yes, Dr. Z. <laughs> Thanks so much, Bobby. Um, Julie, would you say it all, like, especially for kids and young people, when you're bombarded with social media and you see what looks to you to be perfection, even though pictures are doctored and things are not what they seem, um, it can sometimes cause people to feel self-conscious and think that maybe there's something wrong with me because I'm not what I see. Like, I'm not all these things. Granted, you don't see all the work that went into maybe, you know, what that superstar did before they were what you, what you see now. You just see what they are now. And then you question, you know, is there something wrong with the person that I am? Am I not okay? Do you find children, students, kids kind of tackling some of those kind of issues um, in the classroom, out of the classroom, their social circles? I mean, they are swimming in it. They are just swimming in it. And I would like to see our society get to the point that we got to with Big Tobacco, where we started understanding the role that um, these corporations, they're, they're preying on our young people. And it is really harmful. And I have not read the reports that have come out, but from what I understand from the summaries and from what I see with my own eyes and what we know about the human brain, we're, we're constantly comparing ourselves to our peer groups. And when you're looking at a curated social media feed that's 
unrealistic or not reflective of the human exp the broad human experience. Um, and you and then also the algorithms take you down certain rabbit holes, you know, and then you're the dopamine in your brain's like, like, I'm going for those like, like everything is working against our young people from having pers be able to have perspective about what's going on for them and why they feel so bad when they spend time on social media. All they know is that they can't get off social media because then they won't belong because they feel that that is the place they have to be in order to be a, be a part of what's going on in their social worlds. And so I just think we have to get to a place where as adults, we prioritize our young people and their mental health and we start putting limits on things or we start standing up through, I don't even know what the, the, policy answer is but it has to be addressed and it has to be done in a very clear way like it was with big tobacco and deborah you um work with students as well um with your perspectives on social media and how it um impacts the view that a child or even maybe an adult like adults probably look at some of the images too and say well my life's not as great as theirs so what's wrong with my life um i guess what what would you um contribute or add to this perspective um i wholeheartedly agree with everything you said julie um and i'm even noticing like with Weight Watchers there or WW and now they're, you know, they have a program for eight year olds, which, oh my God, I can't even, I can't even. Um, and my daughter was watching something on YouTube the other day and there was some weight loss ad and she, uh, and I didn't know she saw that. Uh, we've tightened up those restrictions since then. But um, the bedtime conversation that night was all, of, she wanted to know about weight. And so I went all in. I may have mentioned the $72 billion diet industry and um, how advertisers are lying to her. But it's it, if I don't talk about it now, somebody else is going to keep adding to that other conversation. And little girls and little boys of even three, four, and five, they talk about their bodies. They're talking about this stuff. They're seeing it everywhere. And so that night with my daughter, I we did a lot of affirmations. And I said, uh, there is no wrong way to have a body. Um, I, all the things that I needed to hear when I was little. And perhaps that would have led me away from disordered eating. Um, but I grew up in a house where that, uh, you know, watching what you're eating is very, it was a very, it was the 90s. It was a very normal thing to do. Not my house. So that night I was like, Luna, you can be healthy at every size. But think of the women in our world and our lives that we love. They're all different sizes. They come in all different shapes and colors. And that makes life beautiful. I needed to hear that so badly when I was little. So, and that's the work that I do here at the JCC is, is, you know, spreading that word to my teachers to spread to the children, um, you know, say the things that you needed to hear, be the teacher that you needed to have when you were little. And hopefully we'll have some really great outcomes from that. That's such a great message. Be the teacher that you needed. Um, because there's always somebody going through what you were going through when you were their age or somebody is in a place where you once were. And maybe you know, you know, how to fit in that space in a way that could help them move forward. That's so important. We've got about a little under 30 minutes left. If you have any questions or comments that you would like to share, if anything that you're hearing is connecting with you, let us know that too. Um, and we'll be happy to share those comments with anyone, um, any of the participants here, if you'd like to share with them. Um, I missed a comment here, it looks like, from Bobby. Fear cripples us, Deborah, keep digging deep. Thanks so much for sharing that, Bobby. And I feel it's an ongoing process, really. Um, you know, the process of, 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 well, internal work and growth, but then also embracing and learning to love the person that we are. Um, and, and that may be, for many of us, a lifelong journey. Um, but the as we've talked about before, I know, Dr. Z, like the more 
um, courage that we find to embrace the person that we actually are and not just embrace that person, but share that person with the world. Um, it kind of um, gives people a chance to connect with the truest parts of who you are. And then you bring in that energy um, because the people that really should be in your life respond to that energy of the person that you truly are. Um, moving forward, I'm, I was hoping Lehman would join us, but I'm going to pop up one of the comments here um, that I had wanted to discuss with him, but we can still um, discuss it in this space too. Um, one of his books, um, one of his children's books, it deals with uh, Abraham Lincoln and the battle with depression. Um, and he says, come on, people, let's get the conversation going. We all have been depressed at one time in our life. It's not a shameful thing. Talking about it will help so much. It will empower us all by sharing. It's, uh, this particular book is focused on children to understand more about depression. Um, when you were growing up, did you experienced Deborah growing up depression and then how do you remember how you coped and dealt with that or what resources you try to make available or how you try to um, maybe create that space if you didn't have what you needed for other people today it showed up when I was little as um, it was like a mix of anxiety and depression and it was mostly depression as a teenager Mm -hmm. um, I was a very emotional and like emo teen teenager and mm -hmm. you could tell how I was feeling. I showed you by the way I dressed how I was feeling. It was classic. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't have any resources at all until I was about 14 and um, I was I was showing that I was having a hard time by, by having like compulsions or those obsessions and like trying to find control and I remember um, my mom was folding laundry in the family room and Oprah was on and Mark Summers was on and he was talking mm -hmm. about obsessive compulsive disorder and straightening the fringe on the on the mm -hmm. rug in the living room or something and my mom and I were like ah uh, that sounds very familiar and we looked into that and um, and then I was able to start the process of getting some help. Mm -hmm. But those first 14 years were really a challenge. And it was basically my parents trying to figure out what do we do with this tissue paper child that is so delicate. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really, it was very hard. And Julie, can you talk about, are there any things that like if, if parents are worried that their kids may not be okay, are mm -hmm. there things that they, they may be could do, I guess, to create the space of comfort to have those conversations um, or, 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 you know, things that you find yourself doing when you get the children in the office and you're trying to get them to open up. Um, are there things that you do that you find work that maybe parents could utilize just to as a starting point? Yeah, I mean, I think if you have an ongoing conversation and it's open between you and your child, then that's probably a no brainer. But I would say to any parent that doesn't have that open line of communication going on is the first thing I would do is just show up consistently and try to take that time, which I know can be really hard depending on how much you're working or what other stressors are going on in your life. But those first three minutes in the morning, if you can be there when your child wakes up, and if there can be any kind of touch involved, even if it's a touch on the shoulder, maybe your family isn't huggers, but, you know, any kind of touch in the first three minutes and then the last three minutes of the day and just checking in or saying a word of affirmation and doing that consistently will help build that trust and start to show that child that you're there for them, you're interested in them every day. Um, I think, too, then you know, just being, I always say with my kids, I'm just gonna be real with you. Like, I want to just talk and find out what's going on about this. And again, you know, it's not something that if you haven't been having that with your children, then you decide you want to have it. It's not like overnight it will appear. But if you continue to show up consistently, I too also just encourage parents, like if you're worried about your child, it's okay to bring them to a well child check, which is a very like, a yearly visit to your doctor and just 
it's okay to put it into that space too. I have this concern about my child and that doctor then can have that conversation with you. This is pretty normal developmentally, or yeah, that's something to be concerned about. Let's talk more. So, you know, prior to being like, we need to go to the mental health level, just going to that well child visit and starting the conversation there can feel more comfortable. And this could also be kind of tricky. I would imagine if the parent grew up in a family where they didn't talk about emotions and they didn't talk about how they felt. And now you have a child that maybe has things they want to talk about, but they don't know, they don't know how to have those conversations with their parent and their parent may not be comfortable initiating. Um, but there are conversations that need to be had. Um, what do you, how do, I'm sure you probably navigate that too sometimes. What do you just have to be extra perceptive as a counselor to try to create that space or, or what kind of tips or tools would you offer for, um, a parent that is, I didn't grow up, you know, in a household where, you know, we talked about our feelings, but you're telling me I need to talk to my kid and I don't know where to start. What do you, what do you say mm -hmm. to that parent? Yeah, if I have that opportunity to engage with the parent, I will, and again, I'm not a therapist, but I'll just kind of initiate some conversation about, you know, what what's your biggest worry about um, when you do have that opportunity to talk emotion? Like, how are you, like, kind of allowing them to talk about their own stuff around it rather than focusing on the kid, because if they can loosen their own issues or like the baggage they're carrying or the patterns, if we can just start to think a little differently or tilt our heads and say, oh, it, it could be different, or that's not so scary. Um, and then also just, you know, again, just saying like, if you try to open this conversation up and it feels uncomfortable, that would be normal for you with your history and your past. And also with this not really being a norm for you and your child. So just remember, like, it will feel uncomfortable. It may be weird. They might look at you like, what are you, what are you trying to talk to me about? I mean, I get that from middle schoolers too. And that's okay. You just keep coming back, being your authentic self, like Dr. Z is saying, because they they like re kids want real people. They want connection with people who are going to be real. And so if if you as a parent can just be honest and say, you know, I, I have a concern or this is what I'm feeling, you going out on that limb is the first step. And Dr. Z, I want to bring you in here because I know you have a chance to to work with some young young kids through the Doorstep Foundation and other programs in the community. And I mean, it sort of feels very layered. We're talking about, you know, it's okay not to be okay to convey that to a child, but coming from a parent who's struggling with that reality too, because there there might be that fear, I'm supposed to be the strong one, or I'm supposed to be the one that has it all figured out for my kid. And I don't know how to be vulnerable in this way to create the space for this conversation and to communicate that would be communicating a weakness. And there may be fear around presenting themselves in that way to their child, would you say? Yep, a lot of times it starts at home. Yeah. <laughs> it starts at home. We were raised, I'm in the same age range as Deborah. We were told again to suck it up. So now when we have kids, we have our daughters, we have our sons, they come to us. We don't know how to handle them being emotional. We don't know how to handle them being knowledgeable enough or even willing enough to open up and share where they're not stifling it. They might not know the proper words to put to it, but they're acting out or they're acting in a way that is that can be classified as inappropriate. But it's a way to try to get attention. It's a way to try to get help. A lot of times I run into parents that had parents that raised them again to suck it up. But now the parents that have daughters or have sons below them, they're, they want to change, but they don't know how. And I always try to tell them, your goal is not to necessarily fix what your child is going through. You have to start by just listening. You don't always have to have an answer. Sometimes you just start by listening. A lot of times your child will deal with it themselves. They will kind of find an answer that works best for them because then that's them working through their process. But you have to be willing to at least listen. Mm -hmm. That's where it starts. Being willing 
to listen and open up and not offer any judgment. Because when you offer judgment, then their kid is not landing on a safe space. And the safe space should be with you as the, as the parent. Do you feel at all that some parents feel that their kids expect them to be perfect, but maybe the expectation that kids have isn't perfection, but parents may have that expectation and it gets in the way. Because parents don't know that they need healing too. <laughs> Sometimes they don't know that they need to deal with their stuff too. And a lot of times, or I can just say just even just in the past couple of years or so, I have run into parents that realized that they were not healed or that they had some inhibitions or um, things that they needed to deal with while dealing with their child. Mm -hmm. You know, I would tell a parent, like, you have to show up differently. If you want that person to change, you need to show up differently. Well, why? Well, because it's not a silo. Mm -hmm. You are working together. They are in your home. They need to see you, as Julie said, being real. Mm -hmm. They know when you're faking. They know when you're lying. They know when you're not being true to yourself. And then they're acting out even more. So if you show up real or when you show up real, your child will show up different for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Deborah, would you like to add on to that um, perspective? Definitely. Um, I think that's exactly right. We need to just be real with our children and we need, and with our friends and with our family and, um, and be vulnerable because ultimately we're modeling. We can model for our friends and we can model for our children how to how to handle hard things. I say to Luna all the time, you can do hard things. Uh, you are so capable. Nobody ever told me I was capable when I was little and I grew up thinking I can do no things, none of the things. <laughs> so now I tell her every day, you're so capable. Instead of saying, good job, I say, you did X, Y, and Z, and I really describe the thing that she did and make it more intentional. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I try to be more intentional with all of the relationships that I have to just make them more meaningful and to build that trust so people can feel like they can come to me, so my daughter can feel like she can come to me. And I wanted to go back a little bit because we were talking about um, how to help parents sort of navigate when they um, are made aware that something might be amiss. Um, yeah. and that, that cry for attention or a behavior that isn't appropriate and they're looking for attention. And I always say to parents that come to me and they're like, what is this that I'm seeing? And they say, they just want attention. It's like, mm, they, that's, they want connection. Reframe that as they aren't looking for attention. They're looking for connection. Mm -hmm. Crouch down, get on the ground, put out your hands and just say, I'm here. What's going on? Or, and, you know, like Dr. Z was saying, you don't need to fix anything. Don't go in guns blazing like you need to save the day and be the parent and fix all the things. You just need to be like, hmm, what's going on? And just be curious. Just listen. And and if it's something with a, a friendship, just be like, well, yeah, that's really hard. I, I hear you. Or that's, that's tough. I've been through that, too. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. And just keep it at that. And the more you do that, like Julie said, the more you just do those three minutes, that little connection, that little pat on the shoulder, that helps build that relationship up. And sometimes the tone of how you create that space matters. I mean, if you were to go up to your child and say, what's wrong with you? Like that doesn't make somebody want to open up. It makes them, it makes them like want to recoil. And, you know, sometimes, you know, if people are in that, space of, you know, I don't know how to be sensitive and create space. So I'm just going to try to create it in the lane in which I'm comfortable, which is being like this tough person that has it all figured out. What's wrong with you? And, you know, mm -hmm. that makes make the child recoil. So sometimes you have to be something other than like what's comfortable for you to be comfortable, to create the space that your child needs for, for that moment. Would you say, Julie? Like maybe yeah. you have to be soft, yeah. like to create the space when maybe your natural tendency is to be more brash. I mean, like, Absolutely. But you're, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, just, I mean, on the generational train, you know, my mom worked a job in corporate at a time where it's very stressful to be a woman in corporate and she did not really code switch when she came home. So, you know, I think that for her, she's aged and I've really 
because I was also highly sensitive and had really different needs. And, you know, in my 20s was really just trying to be like explaining to her. And finally, I think she was like, oh, I actually have to like change how I'm how I'm momming you. Like I, I have to like you like I can't be to you what I need. She had to really get out of herself and say, OK, I'm talking to Julie now. So I'm going to say, how are you, you know, how are things going and allow and allow a little space for for emotion when that is just deeply uncomfortable for her. And she has no need for it. She has absolutely no need for it. But she has a need for a relationship with me, as do I with her. And so I've really appreciated over the course of years of us just figuring it out, even though we're really different in terms of how we exist in the world. Um, so absolutely. And I think stress levels really impact our ability to be present as parents. And I, I'm the first to admit, if I've had a really stressful day at school, um, it, it can be really challenging to show up as the parent I want to show up as. And that's where it comes in those coping skills, breathing, mindfulness, making sure I exercise briefly, you know, before coming into the home. So um, it, it is challenging to show up as our real selves and be real. Yes, that is so true. Lehman, thanks for joining us. Yay. Yay. <laughs> sick. She's in the hospital. So I'm like, ah. Oh, what happened? Uh, we're still figuring it out. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, do, we have a few more minutes left. Um, do you have yeah. just some time to talk to us a little bit? I wanted to in include you because I love what you're doing with your books. And we talked just briefly about um, one of your uh, comments on social media. These are your three books here. The Adventures of Papa Lemons uh, is your series. Yes. And is this Papa Lemon here? Yeah, that's my grandfather, Papa oh, Lemon. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And um, you've taken uh, Papa Lemon and transformed him into a children's book series. And it's such an awesome way to educate kids about some of the the, the challenging things that they may deal with, like depression yeah. or bullying, for example. And I pulled this up a little earlier, but um, now that you're here, let's um, chat about it. It was the book that you did on Abraham uh, Lincoln and the battle with depression. And on social media, you said, come on, people, let's get the conversation going. We all have been depressed at one time in our life. It's not a shameful thing. Talking about it will help so much. It will empower us all by sharing um, the book's focus for children to understand more about depression. Um, what motivated you to create this series and why did you feel it was important to have some of the conversations that you're creating space for in this format? Well, one, the reason why I created the series, I wanted to honor my grandfather by teaching kids about multicultural history. Mm -hmm. And through the process, I never thought I would be writing about social stories like depression and bullying. Uh, but uh, there are some family members of mine that are suffering with depression. And that's what spurred me to start writing. And it's, when I go to different schools, uh, I noticed a lot of kids who are battling with depression. So I thought, you know, we need to start talking about this. We can't you keep it as like it's a, something in the closet. You can't talk about it. And you know, when I started talking about it, a lot of kids start opening up more and more and more. And uh, to my surprise, I never knew that I would need that book because uh, 2020 was a horrible year for me. Um, uh, my youngest daughter was murdered mm -hmm. and uh, that just spiraled me into depression and still, mm -hmm. I'm dealing with that right now, trying to get my feet back under my ground, under me, you know? So it's been a really rough time. And I wrote a book, everybody kept telling me, you need to write a book on grief and on grief. And I'm like, that's something I can't do. I can't do it right now. And I just kept getting pressure from people that keep asking me. And at that time, I couldn't even read, tell you the truth. My mm -hmm. focus was so gone, I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but then with a lot of prayer, because that's the only way I got through it, uh, with my daughter's uh, death, um, God gave me the words to write. So I did write a book on grief so kids can understand grief and the stages of grief and being able to talk about it, you know. And I think um, it's a really important thing that we, since 2020, was, all this crazy stuff's been going on, uh, we need to really start that conversation and let kids know how to talk about it, teach them how to talk about it. And 
uh, as well as parents, because, you know, some of us have had to deal with those mm -hmm. type of strong issues. And once it hits you, you're like, whoa, you know, mm -hmm. this don't happen to me, you know, I'm, you know, that happens on TV. And mm -hmm. just to uh, process through that was very, mm -hmm. very difficult, still difficult. And I'm um, just trying to uh, help somebody with my grief to teach them how to get through it. Well, I'm so sorry for your loss. And it's, it's, it takes time and people grieve in different ways. Yep. And, mm -hmm. you know, while everyone in the world may want you to write where they want you to write, you always have to write when you're ready. Right. And yep. when yep. you feel like, it's the right time for you. Yeah. Um, Denisha says here, my God, sending healing prayers your way. Need them all. I need them all. You know, so yes. I, you know, that's what I've been leaning on trying to uh, make it through this. And it's just been a, a horrible year and a half trying mm -hmm. to, um, you know, still miss my baby girl. You know, she was just like, you know, she was 23 years old. And, mm -hmm. you know, she is my little partner. And we would always, we had the same sense of humor and stuff like that. So it's just uh, really, really tough to uh, get through this one here. So I'm just trying yeah. to uh, be there for my other kids and, you know, have that strength for them. But, you know, you still have just, those days. Yeah. And, and allow yourself that time to feel what you feel and, and to, it, to navigate um, what is an experience that you've never had before yeah, and yeah. it's you know it's it's new and yeah. you have to give yourself that time to grieve yeah um and feel all of it so if yeah. i can help anyone with this book hopefully it'll be out in the spring um mm -hmm. and uh it's just out there uh it's just a tool to help you you know mm -hmm. navigate through that because it's some tricky twists and turns through that road and uh you know, I'm just hoping I can help somebody navigate through that. Absolutely. Um, and we'll continue to hold a good thought for you as you um, take it one step at a time. Julie, I know we've talked about it before. This last year has been tough in so many ways, not mm -hmm. only with the pandemic, but violence and kids mm -hmm. dealing with the loss of friends. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's the compounded, you've got the isolation created by the pandemic and they're learning differently, but then they are friends too of kids that mm -hmm. um, may have been killed in some of the, the crime and the situations that we've been mm -hmm. dealing with. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find yourself navigating that with some of the kids that that you see as a school counselor? Mm -hmm. um, and what, what kind of space do you have to create to cope with that? Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely impacting our young people. So impacting all the whole family system for families that are going through it. Um, and so we do see that. I think one of the first things we try to do when we learn about that, when kids are able to share and open up or when we find out about it affecting them is try to connect them with you know, mental health services that are deeper than a school counselor can provide. And luckily a lot of schools these days do have therapists that work, you know, collaboratively on school sites. So we're able to connect folks usually. Um, and then just ongoing working with the family, how can we support and with the student? Again, you know, sometimes students, like Papa Lemon said, like deal with it differently. Like some kids aren't going to want to talk about it at school. Some kids are going to compartmentalize it and just want to come to school and be at school. And other kids, they're, it, it's going to be a difficult adjustment for them. So, but I'm definitely also hearing from students of just concern about their safety or, you know, feeling, you know, discomfort of being in the neighborhood or not sure where they can go, where they can be or witnessing things that maybe don't impact their family directly, but they see it or they see the aftermath. And so it, it's all a level of trauma and grief mm -hmm. that they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I want to um, go ahead and share these quickly. Um, Bobby says, Lehman, sending prayers, love, and light your way. You, um, you. Yes, give yourself grace. Um, thank you for being a beautiful flower in our community. You are. 
and uh, tough times we live in from Alita there. Um, I want to ask you before we wrap up, do you feel, Lehman, that the books that you're writing, they, they are really a vehicle for tough conversations? Sometimes kids may want not want to talk about bullying, but maybe they that conversation can start with a book. Maybe they're not sure or the parents aren't mm -hmm. sure where to start with a conversation about depression, but maybe they can start with reading that book with their mm -hmm. child and asking mm -hmm. questions. What have you seen come out of um, your willingness to share your grandfather and the stories that you are in this way? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's been a wide range. You know, I uh, when I first started out, I like to introduce my grandparents, my grandfather to the kids and tell them more about him, how he was when he was born in the 1800s and his life in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And even up to the, his death and how he passed away. And I talk about how the last time I seen my grandfather and to my surprise, um, I was at a school uh, and when I finished my, my session, the teacher uh, waved at me to the back of the room and I guess a kid was crying and everything, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, she's like, you know, how did you do that? You know, this is such a great thing. You got her to open up. You know, she has so much going on and now she's really, because she started talking to me, the kid, I had no idea what was going on in her life, but her, one of her parents had just passed away mm -hmm. and it gave her the opportunity to start talking about what she was going through so she could share with her classmates and everything. And then the other classmates start talking about what they've experienced. You know, I've you know, been to a lot of school districts and a lot of these kids, you know, I'm 58 years old. I haven't seen uh, nowhere near as much trauma as a lot of these kids have been mm -hmm. going through. And I'm mm -hmm. listening to these third and fourth graders telling me their story. And I'm like, oh my God, in my mind, it's like, how do these kids get through this, you know? But by the way I present myself and talk to them and let them know, I don't put myself up here. I bring myself mm -hmm. to their level so they mm -hmm. can be comfortable and they can ask me any questions they want. And I you know, bring in a few props so, so they can just start engaging with me and I can start asking them questions and they start asking me questions about Papa Lemon. And they say, oh, my grandfather was like this. And I get them to understand, hey, you know, you guys were more alike than different. You know, your grandfather was like this, your grandmother was this way, and so is this kid. So you see how we all are like a community. So by the time I'm done with the classroom, it's more of a community than a uh, classroom because all the kids are just engaged, learning about each other and telling their story and writing about their uh, grandparents mm -hmm. because I always get the kids to write a little story about their grandparents. I give them three mm -hmm. key uh, questions to uh, interview someone. And through those questions, they come up with a little story and I'll let them come up to the classroom, read their story to the class and they can answer questions. So that makes them feel so empowered. They can ask questions to their class, answer questions to their classmates. And so it's a fun session. I have two days with the kids and I just, you know, want them to feel, feel comfortable around me when I'm talking and, you know, they're like, say, hey, you're, you're, you're Papa Lehman, you're Papa Lehman now. So, <laughs> so, yeah. Do you feel that um, that sharing this passion, does it help you cope with some of the things that you're dealing with too, to share like of yourself in this way? Uh, up until now, you know, I haven't had an opportunity to really process what I'm going through. Okay. But um, in the past year, most definitely, um, my mm -hmm. um, my niece, she had suffered a coronary artery dissection mm. one week after she had her baby. She survived. Mm. And I that spurred me to write a book on Dr. Daniel Hill Williams. So mm -hmm. I'm getting kids to understand and this is stuff that's really real and teach them how to, you know, be prepared for um, you know, their health, you know, eating right, getting enough sleep, uh, exercising. So we get a lot of conversation back and forth on each book that I write about. And uh, it's just a, a fun time. I really miss being with the kids. Um, but right now, I think what I really want to do is um, work with middle school and high school girls mm -hmm. and talk to them about my, my Lizzie, my daughter Lizzie, mm -hmm. and uh, just let them understand, listen to your 
your um, inner voice, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. because that's telling you what's right and what's wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's what took my baby girl away from me. She has such a big heart and she was just trying to help somebody that was manipulating her. And, mm-hmm. you know, so that's what I'm trying to talk to girls right now and, you know, tell my story. Yeah. And uh, hopefully I can reach someone, you know, if I can help one. Yeah. If I can help one, you know, I would hate for any other family to go through what I went through because this is, say, it's, it's rough. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, I will continue to hold a good thought for you as you navigate the space, this space and um, hopefully those paths will reveal themselves and those spaces will Mm-hmm. Um, reveal themselves for you to be able to share those stories um, in the way that you want to hopefully help someone else. Um, mm-hmm. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us, Lehman, Julie, Deborah, Dr. Z, all of you. Um, mm-hmm. Let's chat wouldn't be possible mm-hmm. without you. Um, the crazy times that we're in, we can't always just meet up for, um, you know, in a group the way we want to, but this is mm-hmm. just such a great way to get to meet some of the awesome people that call the Twin Cities home in a way that I don't necessarily get to talk to people on the news. So thank you all for sharing this space with me. And I'm so appreciative of you being a part of the Let's Chat family. Um, Before we go, I'll quickly share with everyone. Just please uh, forgive me for being late. I'm just so sorry. Oh, you're forgiven? My my granddaughter, I just, so crazy getting No, don't even sweat it. I'll have you back. You'll get another invitation from me. So don't even worry about it. All of y'all are officially part of the Let's Chat family. So you'll be back. (laughs) Absolutely. I want to share quickly. um, So next week, we're going to be talking about craft connections that count. Um, so I'm, I found some awesome people that are amazing at networking and I wanted to talk to them about networking and, you know, some tips and tools and techniques that could be beneficial to others that um, are trying to expand their circle. Um, I've actually got one more person that's joining that conversation. So I'll be updating this graphic here, um, but certainly excited about that conversation too. Thank you all so much for joining us. If you all can hang around for just um, a couple of minutes, I'm going to end the broadcast and then I'll talk to you in the backstage area. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.